and a very warm welcome to you this Tuesday morning on BBC One. Hello there, good morning. Welcome to Breakfast Today with Nina Warhurst and John Kemp. Our headlines today. The final farewell. Queen Elizabeth is laid to rest in Windsor alongside her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. The private committal service followed the Queen's state funeral as the nation said goodbye. And as Westminster gets back to work, the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, will vow to spend billions more on military aid for Ukraine. It's Tuesday the 20th of September. Our main story, the royal family will observe another week of mourning for Queen Elizabeth and are not expected to carry out any official engagements. That's at the request of King Charles. Yes, the late monarch was laid to rest with her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, during a private burial service yesterday evening, which was attended just by close family. And that followed, of course, a state funeral on a scale we've not seen for six decades. Dan Johnson has been looking back at the whole day. What are we to make of such shared sorrow? How does this emotional response inform our understanding of who we are? Beneath the turning leaves of Windsor's long walk, her late majesty's coffin passed to the place she called home and where she was laid to rest. A reign at its end, the culmination of 10 days of collective grief. So as the public gaze finally yields, how shall we reflect on this long procession of mourning? Earlier on, the music got me, some of the tunes, um, yeah, and now I just feel a blubbering wreck, but I suppose it's good to let it out. Emotional, difficult. I had, must say I had, I had a lump in my throat. I'm, I can quite happily say that I did feel very emotional about it, and it was hard. I think it's quite special that we still have this as a, a country. The pomp and ceremony is something really special that we have here in the UK and I think it's something, yeah, that we should continue to, to have something quite special. It doesn't happen anywhere else, does it? You're so lucky. This was the grandest occasion Britain could stage. From Westminster Hall, pulled by Royal Navy sailors, just the short distance across Parliament Square. And a reminder, here is a family's grief in full public glare. The crisp morning light of Westminster Abbey fell on a congregation of global leaders and generations of royals. The eyes of the world watched a solemn service of thanksgiving in high praise and rousing hymns. Then the slow march resumed down Whitehall with military precision and remembrance. She was our boss. I was really proud to serve for her, you know, and she was everything. Everything we did, it was HMS, Her Majesty, ship, everything. She was just brilliant, a true leader. I always looked up to her, um, but it's when I met her that I realised what, what kind of a lady she was. And t to me, it was, it was family, you know, um, knowing that she really did care for for her, you know, for her, her people and, and, and her country. They filled the length of the Mall and further, knowing the bedrock of so much for so long has gone. And now we, the new Elizabethans, will take our place in history's endless procession. By the time she reached Windsor, thousands were waiting to pay homage, as were these two, Mick and Sandy. Of course, this is first and foremost about sadness, respect, 
and giving thanks for the Queen herself and her life of service. But then there's so much more going on here because it's raised so many deeper emotions in so many different people. And whether you support the monarchy or you don't, this is undoubtedly a significant moment in our civic life. I think it's hugely important. I mean, how often do you get to see history unfolding in front of your eyes? Um, and such an incredible role model as well. Um, I know for a long time he'll talk about it, and I hope when he's older he'll be able to talk about the Queen to his children too. I didn't expect this amount of people to be here, and like it reminds me, I lost my mum about three years ago, and it brings back the memory of that, and then everybody coming together. It's been so lovely to... And uniting in friendships forged in this time of queues and crowds. I think it's an absolute moment in history. I think it's pivotal. Uh, um, I don't think we'll ever see anything like of this again. She was very, very special queen, human mother, grandmother. Um, and it felt appropriate to be here to pay respects. The way it's seamlessly run, uh, all of the events, how the sort of royal family have uh, have managed the last few days, so professional and really feel for them. It must have been so, so difficult. Um, but you know, it, it makes me proud to be British. In St George's Chapel. The last rites of monarchy were performed in ancient ceremony. There are now new passages in the story of this kingdom. But in leaving Elizabeth II finally to her family, we're gently closing an entire volume of our rich and treasured history. Dan Johnson, BBC News, Windsor. What a day, what an extraordinary 10 days it's been. Uh, we speak now to our correspondent, Charlotte Gallagher, who's uh, in Windsor for us this morning. And Windsor, uh, Charlotte, you've spoken to us several times over the last week or so. You've been with the crowds. You, you've witnessed this from start to finish. Uh, but the period of royal mourning actually continues, doesn't it, within the royal household for, for a little longer yet? morning John it does indeed royal morning will continue until next Monday so what we can expect is flags on all royal buildings will be at half mast unless King Charles is there if he's there the royal standard will be raised to its full height and it's unlikely we'll see any of the royal family at public engagements and I think probably for them, that will be a huge relief, won't it, John? I mean, the number of times we've seen, especially King Charles, out and about since his mother died, meeting world leaders, meeting UK politicians, meeting well-wishers, even looking at it, it looked exhausting, didn't it? And now this is a time for private grief, for the family to come together. They're not going to be on display as they have been over the last... 10 days or so. It's been a really, really emotional time for them, an emotional time for the country as well. But the country now, flags on other buildings will be raised to full height again and life will be getting back to normal. But I know a lot of people will still be reflecting on the life of Queen Elizabeth and what's happened in the UK over this time. It's been a monumental, historic time. Charlotte, thank you very much indeed. That's a really interesting point Charlotte makes, isn't it, about the, the royal family needing time to just get a, across this and get their, their heads together. So many people were saying that to us in the crowds in London yesterday. I hope they now get time to, to be themselves and to hear. Yeah, the timetable for the king and queen mm. consort, it was back to back, wasn't it? I think they had one day of rest mm. in between and so for them it'll be that time to kind of reflect and take it all in, as it is for lots of people. Um, it's coming up to 10 past six, and uh, Parliament resumes today after a 10-day suspension following the Queen's death. Carol, thank you very much indeed. We're just uh, looking through the papers here this morning. Uh, they're here, and there are some stunning images, aren't there? The front page is just re recapturing yeah. that moment of history. I mean, the likes of which we're probably unlikely to see again in our lifetime, aren't they? Um, let's have a look then. All of the front pages, of course, dedicated to the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II. An outpouring of love. That's the headline in the Telegraph. The front page has a picture of the king placing the colours of the Grenadier Guards on his mother's coffin. Uh, the Guardian's front page, uh, their headline is The Final Farewell. And that picture shows the late monarch's coffin being carried by pallbearers. They did a tremendous job, didn't they, yesterday? Adorned with those flowers, which told their own story, I think, chosen because of their various connections to the Queen. 
uh, and the imperial state crown, of course, and the sovereign's orb and scepter on top. The eye describes the day as representing the end of an Elizabethan age as hundreds of thousands of people line the route from Westminster to Windsor to say thank you and goodbye. And the mirror has a very simple front page, just that single picture again with the words, until we meet again. Lots of people yesterday um, talking about those who were carrying the coffin and that massive responsibility for those young men. Mm. Incredible. And you were down there. Yeah. What's it been like to be in London over the past week or so? It's been a privilege. It's been remarkable. It's been, yeah, it's been extraordinary. Just we've spoken to thousands of people on breakfast and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been a moment, hasn't it? It's just a, a moment that we'll always remember. I think what struck me is, is, is how surprised a lot of people in the crowds felt. About how they felt. About how they felt. Yeah. And, you know, people were saying, if, if you'd asked me a couple of weeks ago how I might react to this moment, I would have never expected yes. that I would feel this way. I yeah. would never have expected I would have come to London or Edinburgh uh, and, and queued for hours to, to file in line past the coffin. But, you know, it had kind of taken them by surprise. Yeah, their own emotion. Yeah. We were here watching it from Salford. And for me, the thing that I'll remember is the queue. Mm. You know, Charlie was live there on Thursday morning. We were all sitting watching at that point. Mm. It was five hours long. And then it grew and grew. And it became less about the destination yeah. of seeing the coffin and about those shared experiences while people were waiting. And that commitment and the new friendships I found incredibly moving. And then yesterday... I think for lots of people, it just got real. Yeah. I think if you've had to organise a funeral in your family or your friendship group, that period between the death and the burial, yeah. you're so busy. And then all of a sudden the funeral comes and there's that immense sadness. And I feel like a lot of people felt that yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what we were saying earlier is about those connections as well, that, you know, everybody, yes. wherever you were, whether you're in London or Edinburgh or Windsor, but whether you were just at home, you know, everybody knows somebody who's had a letter from the Queen yeah. or who's saw the Queen in a procession 10, 20, 50 years ago. You know, everybody feels that they, you know, whatever their views of monarchy, yes. feels that they have kind of some connection with her. And lots of people who say, I don't necessarily believe in the monarchy, but she was special. Yeah, definitely. We heard that a lot. Uh, it's 19 minutes past six. Uh, we're still keen to hear your connections and your stories. Maybe we'll read some of those out a bit later. So yes, do get in touch definitely. this morning. Uh, Our clock's broken. Well, it's disappeared. Our on-screen clock has disappeared. It's causing chaos for lots of you this morning. You're being in touch, saying you don't know what to do, you don't know what the time is. So if you haven't got a clock in the house or a phone, the time is 6.26. Well done, John. I'll just keep this here all morning for you. I'll keep reminding <laughs> you. I'm now the talking clock. Yeah, apologies for that. We are working on it. We're going to try and get the clock back this morning, but we'll, we will update you on the time as and when. It is exactly... 27 minutes past six and no, time, to get, is now. time to get the news, the travel and the weather where you are. See you in a few minutes. <laughs> Three, four minutes. Hello, good morning. This is BBC London. I'm Frankie McCamley. An intensive clean-up operation has begun after hundreds of thousands of people came to the capital for the Queen's lying in state and funeral. In Westminster, street cleaning vehicles were decorated with black ribbons as they cleared the litter. Throughout the night, work was also underway to replace all the traffic lights that were taken down for the procession. Floral tributes left for the Queen in Green and Hyde Park are going to stay put to give people time to get down and take a look. Over the last 10 days, visitors from around the world have descended on the capital, leaving beautiful displays of messages and support. Yes. Well, that's it from me. There's plenty more on our website, including a look at how the capital paid tribute to the Queen yesterday. I'm back in half an hour. Bye bye. Good morning. We've got the clock. Oh, we haven't got the clock back. We are assured. Got, oh, hey, there she is. We've got it back. It's half past six. OK, calm down. We're back to normal. All Just good. start properly now, can't we? Uh, coming up on breakfast this morning. Now, while mourners were gathering inside Westminster Abbey for the state funeral of Queen Elizabeth yesterday, thousands of people were lining the streets of central London. Millions more of us were watching the funeral, that final journey from home. It was a day when people around the UK stood still, fell silent and reflected as the nation bid a final farewell to Britain's longest reigning monarch. Jay McCubbin has this report. 
We watched in our homes, in our churches, in our cinemas, our clubs, our parks. She united us in one final act of togetherness. I live on my own and I didn't really want to be on my own today because it's such an emotional day and I'm never going to experience this again. In Alruos, the church bells rang to call their community together. Brothers in arms, Brian and Paul, had served together in the Gulf War. First thing this morning is I wanted to just uh, reflect on myself uh, and, and just, just watch it in peace. But actually, to come here with Brian, it's, it's been great to get that army brotherhood together. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad I came down, actually. I got very upset. Um, because obviously, as we always say, it's our boss and we'll never have a, another boss like her, I don't think. This emotion is not easy for everyone to understand, nor is it easy to explain. How would you explain the emotion that you've felt today? It's here. Always here. And now, you know, I can honestly say that. I mean, I'm sorry, for everybody, it's all here. I don't know what it is, but we're the best in the world at it, aren't we? So we've got to be like that. You know, that doesn't mean the same. <laughs> Pubs like the Red Beret in Withenshaw opened to offer companionship, community. A lot of my customers that haven't got company, so it's nice for them to come out and have a bit of company and watch something that they'll probably never ever see again. Remember always somebody cares. That's why I made all that, that's not all that. Remember always somebody cares. A moment in which many people thought not just about the monarch but of their own loved ones lost. It was only me and my son and lost me my daughter. She would have been here with us, but unfortunately she died. But it was, you know, we, we, we stick together and it was good. We have to carry on like she did. She was a, she was a stalwart to us all. She was, bless her. God bless her. Wonderful woman. They watched in the Chukta's landing in Leith. I think it's a time to reflect. I think we've all lost someone, and so it's an opportunity and time to think about that, um, those people that have gone and the people you've still got left. And they watched in the Alma pub in Harwich. The youngest was one and the oldest was 91. A perfect British ceremony in the perfect British institution. It was a privilege to be able to share this moment with the um, community around me and my neighbours. Very many watched with neighbours, just as Doreen Dyer did in Milton Keynes. She's just stability, actually. Um, I can't imagine a life without her. The final journey to Windsor now. Some, like Colin Edwards, chose to watch alone. He'd met the Queen 150 times before finally saying his goodbye from his sofa in North Wales. I've watched the whole thing. Incredibly moving, spectacular. Britain is the envy of the world. No other country in the world could stage a show like this. The Queen would be overwhelmed by the response of people. The eyes of perhaps billions of people around the world saw this response and what they saw looked like unity. She means a lot to Northern Ireland. I suppose this country has its friction over the years, but um, she's been 
kind of a force for reconciliation, hasn't she? She'll never be forgotten, will she? Ever, ever. I'm getting emotional, I'm sorry. And so 10 days of national mourning came to an end with images which are likely to be the biggest live television event in history. Images which will never be forgotten. Oh, Jane McCubbin reporting there and just showing that it was about so much more than what was happening in London and in Windsor. Everybody marking it in their own way. And do get in touch and let us know how you spent it yesterday. It's 37 minutes past six and as one era ends, of course another begins. And now our thoughts turn to the new king and what comes next, what kind of reign we will see. Yeah, because King Charles has long campaigned on environmental issues and has been a patron of the Wildlife Trust for more than 40 years. Craig Bennett is the chief executive of the charity and joins us now. Morning to you. Morning. Said to you briefly off air just then, is it from the heart his interest in wildlife and the environment? And you see... <laughs> it absolutely is. I mean, I don't think anyone can question just how passionate he's been about these issues from a very early age, from the whole range of working on climate change, uh, na trying to put nature in recovery and do something about the ecological crisis, to air pollution, to rainforests, to rivers, to farming and moving to more sustainable farming methods. You know, it's amazing to think his first speech on the environment was in 1970. And in that, he talked about the potential role of air pollution in causing cancer. And, you know, it was just a couple of weeks ago the BBC was covering a story that talked about that still and about air pollution causing cancer. It's um, extraordinary how long he's been at this and, and dedicated to this issue and, and really trying to drive change on it. And you, no one can question that it's authentic. I guess the question is, can he continue to be active and, and voicing these concerns as king? I mean, his first speech as monarch after his mother died, when he addressed the nation on TV, he said he made some reference, you know, I'm not going to be able to be as involved in issues in the future as I have been in the past. So do you think he, he might have to scale it back? Maybe you'll see rather less of it. Well, I think he's made very clear indications this year, both in the BBC documentary earlier this year about how he said he knows that the role of monarch is different to the role of Prince of Wales. And as you say, in the speech he gave uh, the, the night after Her Majesty died, you know, he indicated that he will have less time for his charities and, and issues. But, you know, it's also worth bearing in mind, it's not as if Her Majesty uh, didn't do anything on these issues. I mean, it was less than a year ago we had that United Nations Climate Change Conference up in Glasgow, and Her Majesty gave a sort of video speech to world leaders gathered at that, saying it's time to move from talk to action. Uh, and so I think the interesting thing is, is one of the things that's happened over those 50 years in which uh, King Charles has really been pioneering and offering leadership on this issue, it's, they've moved from perhaps the fringe to, to the mainstream. You know, it's no longer controversial to say that we've got to act on climate change or, or try and put uh, nature in recovery. You know, all the political parties agree on that at a headline level now, and they might disagree on the, the intricacies of policy about how to go about it. But actually, I think to, to have a monarch that is saying this is really important and we've, we've got to work together and convene to take urgent action on this agenda, uh, not only is important, but, but that actually would be following in the footsteps of Her Majesty. And actually, we heard, didn't we, about the Queen's soft diplomacy, if you like, around the securing of London 2012, how much mm -hmm. of an impact it can have when a monarch does, behind the scenes, have that sort of influence. Absolutely right. And, it's, and it, the, the important thing is here is what's the specifics of that role. I mean, uh, the monarch can convene, and one of the hugely important roles uh, that King Charles has played over the last 50 years is his role to convene, bring people together to try and find agreement as to how to take uh, action on this. And it's not so much that he's saying this is how to do it, but he's actually providing the space for people to come together to try and find that, that kind of way forward. The conversation around it. Keep Absolutely. That going. Yeah. And he's, he's got amazing knowledge of the detail, though. I mean, one of the things I've found extraordinary over, over several years, I mean, I, I've worked on these issues full time for 30, 25, 30 years. And whenever I meet him, 
uh, it's almost really frustrating that he's got a new piece of information or he's just read something new which uh, is a surprise to me. So he's really up on the detail of this and across that. And I, I found myself often wondering, how does he manage to do does that? Does he know that? He, he somehow he manages to do that. He's always he's on his phone new. beforehand. He's just <laughs> gonna, gonna, something like that, yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering, I mean, if he is king is not able to get as involved in the, as he has been in the past... Uh, a lot of people are saying that his son, Prince William, new Prince of Wales, might take on the same kind of campaigns. Is campaign the right word? But certainly adopting the same issues that, that his father was able to. Are you expecting to see more of William in the future, a higher profile role? I, I think there's been some very clear signals that that will probably be the case. I mean, for a start, we know that Prince William has long cared about these issues as well. I mean, it is a sort of constant through from... Uh, Her Majesty, the former Duke of Edinburgh, both cared about these issues, King Charles and Prince William. It, it, one thing that, that they always have got together is that they're united in, in caring about climate change and caring about nature. Um, but I think what was really interesting is earlier this year at the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, if you remember, there was a, the real focus of uh, the new Prince of Wales' speech at the time was very much about the need to tackle the climate and nature crisis, whereas actually uh, the now King Charles' words were much more about his mother. And it felt to me then that that was a little bit of a handing over of the baton uh, in anticipation of, of what might later come. So it does feel to me like uh, the new Prince of Wales will absolutely want to take up that baton and uh, perhaps King Charles will, will find a way very gently to just emphasise how, how important this is, but in, in a new way. What I really want to know is, you've known him for 20 years, what is he really like? You must have a good sense of his personality. Well, I mean, what I would say is I've always been been struck by, to be honest, his intelligence. You know, it's, uh, I was saying that point before about how it is amazing how, you know, I work full time on these issues and he will still surprise me with a comment or a reference or something he's just just read. Uh, and it's quite extraordinary how he manages to do that. And similarly, it, you know, he might go into a room where there's a reception of a hundred people and he's been given the sort of biographies of people in advance. And when he goes around the room, he will, he will still know something about each of the people in there and he'll be able to strike up conversation about something that's unique to that individual. So he's really pretty sharp in a number of ways. But the, the key thing is just his passion and authenticity for this kind of range of sustainability issues and, and caring about the environment. And actually, behind that, his concern for people, because it's very much driven uh, at the bottom of all that about concerning about people and communities, you know, not just the birds and the bees. Yeah. Because both are so closely linked, aren't they? Craig, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's 6.44. Mm. We have been told. It's 6.57. Let's get the news, the travel and weather where you are. We'll see you in a moment. Hello, good morning. This is BBC London. I'm Frankie McCamley. An intensive clean-up operation has begun after hundreds of thousands of people came to the capital to pay their respects to the Queen. In Westminster, street cleaning vehicles were decorated with black ribbons as they cleared the litter and throughout the night work was also underway to replace all the traffic lights that were taken down for the procession. Well, the Queen's funeral was also a major event for the police, with more than 10,000 officers deployed from every force in the UK. Scotland Yard says as of five o'clock yesterday afternoon, 67 people had been arrested. And as for all of those floral tributes left for the Queen in Hyde Park and Green Park, they're going to stay put until next week to give people a chance to get down and take a look. Over the last 10 days, visitors from around the world have descended on the capital, leaving beautiful displays of messages and support. Well, that's it from me for now. Don't forget to follow us on social media for the latest news. I'm back in half an hour. Back to Nina and John. Bye-bye. Hello there, good morning. Welcome to Breakfast with Nina Warhurst and John Kay. Our headlines today. The final farewell. Queen Elizabeth is laid to rest in Windsor alongside her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. The private committal service followed the Queen's state funeral as the nation said goodbye.
As Westminster gets back to work, the Prime Minister Liz Truss will vow to spend billions more on military aid for Ukraine. It's Tuesday the 20th of September. Our main story, the royal family will observe another week of mourning for Queen Elizabeth and are not expected to carry out any official engagements. That's at the request of King Charles. The late monarch was laid to rest with her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, during a private burial service last night, which was attended just by close family. It followed, of course, the state funeral on a scale we've not seen for six decades. And Dan Johnson has been looking back at the day. What are we to make of such shared sorrow? How does this emotional response inform our understanding of who we are? Beneath the turning leaves of Windsor's long walk, her late majesty's coffin passed to the place she called home and where she was laid to rest. A reign at its end, the culmination of 10 days of collective grief. So as the public gaze finally yields, how shall we reflect on this long procession of mourning? Earlier on, the music got me, some of the tunes, um, yeah, and now I just feel a blubbering wreck, but I suppose it's good to let it out. Emotional, difficult. I had, must say I had, I had a lump in my throat. I'm, I can quite happily say that I did feel very emotional about it, and it was hard. This was the grandest occasion Britain could stage. From Westminster Hall, pulled by Royal Navy sailors, just the short distance across Parliament Square. And a reminder, here is a family's grief in full public glare. The crisp morning light of Westminster Abbey fell on a congregation of global leaders and generations of royals. The eyes of the world watched a solemn service of thanksgiving in high praise and rousing hymns. Then the slow march resumed down Whitehall with military precision and remembrance. She was our boss. I was really proud to serve for her, you know, and she was everything. Everything we did, it was HMS, Her Majesty ship, everything. She was just brilliant, a true leader. I always looked up to her, um, but it's when I met her that I realised what, what kind of a lady she was. And t to me, it was, it was family, you know, um, knowing that she really did care for for her, you know, for her, her people and, and, and her country. They filled the length of the Mall and further, knowing the bedrock of so much for so long has gone. And now we, the new Elizabethans, will take our place in history's endless procession. By the time she reached Windsor, thousands were waiting to pay homage, as were these two, Mick and Sandy. Of course, this is first and foremost about sadness, respect, and giving thanks for the Queen herself and her life of service. But then there's so much more going on here because it's raised so many deeper emotions in so many different people. And whether you support the monarchy or you don't, this is undoubtedly a significant moment in our civic life. I think it's an absolute moment in history. I think it's pivotal. Uh, um, I don't think we'll ever see anything like of this again. She was very, very special queen, human mother, grandmother. Um, and it felt appropriate to be here to pay respect. In St George's Chapel, the last rites of monarchy were performed in ancient ceremony. There are now new passages in the story of this kingdom. But in leaving Elizabeth II finally to her family, we're gently closing an entire volume of our rich and treasured history. Dan Johnson, BBC News, Windsor.
What a day it was. Well, the royal family uh, remain in private mourning for the next week or so. Our correspondent Charlotte Gallagher is uh, at Windsor Castle for us this morning where they remain. And I suppose, Charlotte, now finally, after 10 days of, of massive public scrutiny and attention, the family get a time for private grief. They do, John, and I imagine it's a relief to them all, but especially King Charles and the Queen Consort Camilla, who haven't stopped, have they? Since the Queen died, there's been public engagements, there's been world leaders to meet, there's been UK politicians to meet. King Charles has not only been grieving his mum, but he's also had to start this job, one of the biggest jobs in the world. So much responsibility and so much scrutiny. Even when he was standing around the coffin of his mother, the cameras of the world were focused on him. And now is the time for the family to grieve privately, to come together. And I'm sure it's going to be really, really emotional. We won't see probably the royal family in public until next Monday. That's when the period of royal mourning is over. And on every royal building, the flag will fly at half-mast in honour of Queen Elizabeth, apart from where King Charles is in residence. That, then the royal standard will fly at its full height. But for the rest of us, things are now starting to get back to normal, aren't they? On this street where I'm on now, the railings are being removed from where the crowds were yesterday. The pub down the road is getting the delivery. Things are very, very busy. But I'm sure lots of people at home will be thinking about the Queen and thinking about her life and what she meant to them still. Indeed they will. Charlotte, thank you very much indeed. Charlotte Gallagher there at Windsor. And Charlotte saying things turning back to normal. It's the case in, in politics, isn't it, this morning? Yeah, it is indeed, because our Parliament resumes today after a 10-day suspension following the Queen's death. And somebody else with a, a new job to get their heads around, the new Prime Minister. Uh, rail services from London's Paddington station remain disrupted this morning because of problems with overhead power lines. Uh, passengers hoping to travel to London to watch the Queen's funeral procession yesterday were also affected by that. Network Rail has apologised and is advising passengers not to travel today unless absolutely necessary. True. Uh, it's 26 minutes past seven. It's time to get the news, the travel and weather where you're watching breakfast this morning. We'll see you in a moment. The Great Leveller. Hello, good morning. This is BBC London. I'm Frankie McCamley. An intensive clean-up operation has begun after hundreds of thousands of people came to the capital to pay their respects to the Queen. In Westminster, street cleaning vehicles were decorated with black ribbons as they cleared the litter. Throughout the night, work was also underway to replace all the traffic lights that were taken down for the procession. And the Queen's funeral was also a major event for the police, with more than 10,000 officers deployed from every force in the UK. Scotland Yard says as of five o'clock yesterday afternoon, 67 people had been arrested. And as for all of those floral tributes left for the Queen in Green and Hyde Park, well, they're going to stay put until next week to give people time, chance to go down and take a look. Over the last 10 days, visitors from around the world have descended on the capital, leaving beautiful displays and messages of support. Well, that's it from me for now. Don't forget to follow us on social media. I'm back at half eight. Bye bye. Hello there, good morning. Welcome to Breakfast Today with Nina and John. Well, yesterday on the streets and in their homes, the nation stood still to witness the funeral of Queen Elizabeth and the second and her final journey to Windsor Castle. Thousands of us uh, watched in person that military procession in central London, uh, the first of its kind for nearly six decades. And we thought this morning we'd just take a moment just to pause and look back at some of those most poignant images.
Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the people of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? I solemnly promise so to do. Rarely has such a promise been so well kept. dignified presence has given us confidence to face the future as she did with courage and with hope. Those pictures, I mean, you could watch them all day, couldn't you? Just incredible scenes that we saw from the beginning of the end uh, to the end of the day. And a real finality to it, wasn't mm. there? Because mm. there's always that period between someone's death and the funeral where things are being organised, there's lots of reflection, and then all of a sudden it feels like, right, this is the end and it really is time to say goodbye. Yeah, that's what lots of people were saying in the crowds to us yesterday. They were saying that it's only now that I I kind of believe it, that I've seen the yeah. coffin, I've, I've witnessed this moment. Yeah. That, uh, I've seen it on the telly and seen it in the papers over the last few days, but now it kind of makes sense to me. Uh, the time now is 7.33 and we're joined on breakfast by the new Culture Secretary, Michelle Donnellan, whose government department, of course, was involved in the organisation and the administration of those events to honour the Queen. Good morning to you. Thanks for joining us uh, today. It must have been a busy start to your new job over the last um, 10 or 11 days or so. What, what, what have been the biggest challenges for your department of, of organising uh, the Queen's uh, goodbye? Um, yeah, you're quite right. Um, and there's no, no dress rehearsal, is there, uh, for this kind of scenario? You know, it's been in the plans for, for, for years, but obviously um, then we've stress tested everything uh, and worked with community groups. But, I, you know, as you were saying a moment ago, a, a lot of us felt like it was, it was unbelievable. We almost expected the Queen to, to live forever. And that's one of the reasons why you saw such an outpouring of, of grief and people wanting to commemorate that, those 70 years of service. And that the queue was just phenomenal to, to, for those people wanting to, to go and see her lying in, in state. And also the community groups that supported you know, from the, uh, the Red Cross to the Samaritans, to um, the police as well, um, to our partners down the South Bank who, uh, and lots of cafes and restaurants that opened uh, late and into the, the late hours to help people access their facilities. It was a real team effort to, to enable people to have that moment uh, to, to say goodbye. And I want to pay tribute to everybody that was involved, all the volunteers, the marshals, uh, the stewards, um, it was incredible. I spent the other day, I went to the, to the queue and I chatted to people along the queue that had come from all four uh, parts of, uh, of the UK and, and they, were, they were resolute in their determination to keep waiting hours to, to get their moment to mourn and there were people coming up to them, local public, you know, giving them cake, giving them hot drinks. It was just war uh, heartwarming to, to see the community rallying together I always think, one of the things I always say is that I think that our late monarch was like the glue that brought communities together and, and this was sort of her last act of doing that, if you like. We're just seeing pictures of the queue now. I think, mm. you know, even after several days, they're just mesmerising, incredible yes. pictures, aren't they, of the, the, those numbers. Were you surprised by the number of people who turned out and were prepared to wait and, in, in having to manage it? Do we have any idea how many people filed yeah. past the coffin? To be honest, I wasn't surprised um, because we, we always knew that there would be unprecedented amounts of people wanting to, to say goodbye. And of course, 
The queue was just one of the ways that people did that. Some laid flowers in the park, some uh, waited at, at the barriers to see the royal family entering the vigils. Some also watched the queue online on the BBC Red Box, which you facilitated. Um, we, we think it's about approximately 250 or just a bit north of that. We're crunching the numbers at the moment. We'll confirm that final figure in, in due course. But uh, it was a tremendous effort with everybody involved. And it was quintessentially British, wasn't it, to see that queue and, and everybody um, you know, just participating from celebrities to, uh, to, to, uh, to people all across the UK. Indeed, more than a quarter of a million people. That is extraordinary, isn't it, that, that number? Uh, we know that the royal household continues uh, in private mourning for the next few days, but uh, for the rest of us, life begins returning to normal. Politics mm. starts returning to normal. Uh, and we're expecting a series of announcements from the government this week uh, under the new prime Carol. minister. Carol, Delicious. you're going to enjoy this as well. You're going to enjoy this because over a career spanning four decades, the distinctive baritone voice of Welsh opera singer Sabrin Turfel has delighted millions of us and even earned him a knighthood from the late Queen Elizabeth. Well, now the world-renowned singer is back with a UK tour performing a very personal playlist. Let's have a listen. It's resonating as you speak. It, it, it's wonderful. You've very casually brought in your medal for us. I know no. we asked you to do it. Well, I know we asked you to do it. Because no, I actually proposed. Can <laughs> I bring something that I really feel, after, after everything yesterday, yeah. of course, and that state funeral, from the musical aspect, I thought was just stunning. Oh, the choral wasn't it? singing, wasn't it amazing? the brass playing, and that diminuendo from the Scottish piper was so incredibly uh, moving that even my five-year-old daughter Lily said uh, watching this makes me so sad mm -hmm. dad and you know that the, the, the strength of, of music came through so I thought powerful, and yeah. our connections I, I'm sure with you as well is through what I do through through my art form and through Wales and yes in let's 2006, see that I was please, given the, please share with this oh, this is very important because yeah. the first recipient was was a conductor called Sir Charles McCarris mm -hmm. and he conducted my very first opera with the Welsh National oh, Opera wow. And it's the Queen's Shut medal the for, for music. The Queen's? So, oh, it's so heavy. <laughs> and, um, oh, uh, please, no, 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 let's have a proper look at it. Yeah, that's, yeah, sure. That, that's wonderful. So that's the Queen's medal for music. So uh, I can, uh, a little background. My grandmother loved the Queen. And if there was a picture of me with uh, Prince Charles or Lady Diana or, or anybody from the royal family, she, she would get so excited, my grandmother. So that was the first connection with the royal family. But then things like this started to, to begin with, uh, in the side room of the Royal Albert Hall, I, was, I remember, with the Queen and Prince Philip. And I said to the Queen, I'm so excited to receive this after Sir Charles McCarris last year. And, and my grandmother will be jumping up and down in her little house in, in, uh, in near Carnarvon. And uh, the Queen said, well, then carry on your good work. And that's why you've received it. Do it for your grandmother and do, do it for Wales. And I thought, wow, she's really put me in my place for even questioning why I received this. And Prince Philip put you in your place, didn't he? Prince Philip, of course. Yeah, yeah. He, he was always at the background. And he said to me that in that little room in the Royal Albert Hall, uh, why didn't you shave today? Because he, he liked people to be presented well in a suit and well shaved, maybe because of his background in the army. Um, and I, I had to be as quick as a flash. Of course, it's for, it's for an opera that I'm doing in Her Majesty's Theatre at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. So, Did he forgive you for that? He accepted that excuse? Of course he did. Because <laughs> yeah. you performed for the Queen several times. Uh, again, uh, I can add to you that specifically within something that's to do with Wales, mm. Um, the opening of the Welsh Millennium Centre, uh, the opening of the Senate, uh, connections with Prince Charles, of course, he spearheads so many um, very important, uh, meaningful uh, things to do with our line of work that always he says, or he said, was that uh, uh, Mummy has given me the ballroom again to have someone like the Welsh College of Music and Drama there, the Welsh National Opera there. The last time I was there was for the Oxford Philharmonic, it, just to, for them to be able to have some money towards their foundations, mm. towards the work that they do within music. And that's my connection with you know, Prince Charles. Uh, you know, I think Prince William and Kate would be the perfect uh, prince and princess of Wales. Of course, he likes his sports and she likes her music and, and they spent uh, many years in Anglesey because he was in the RAF 
Uh, and I know from people that have worked on their houses in, in, in Anglesey that these people are, are really normal, so engaging, and they make cups of teas and bring biscuits to the workers. And this is first-hand knowledge. Mm. So I look forward to, to, to see what that brings to Wales. And I, I can say again that like, everything that I am connected with with that has to do with either music or, or, or Wales. And, and you were knighted, of course. What's that like? Yes, well, maybe when I was given the command of the British Empire, I didn't really understand the significance of something like that. Then I was given this, and I began to understand it's really important with the work that I do for Wales and for music. Doing the Queen, then. And, um, yeah, and oh, she did it in 50 minutes. The guy said... You're lucky today, Her Majesty will finish everybody in 50 minutes. And of course, she had Olympians and equestrians and firemen, policemen. Just an incredible day. And uh, I, 2017, I really cherished the fact that my parents uh, are thanked, that the team behind me are thanked. Mm. And that's why I'm, I'm still singing, maybe, and, and about to prepare for a British tour. That's right. Which I also love because, you know, I'm singing away internationally all the time. So now I get to sing in places like Poole and Bath and Aberdeen, Glasgow, Llandidno, which, which I've never, uh, of some of those places, I've never even been to sing one note in. So I really look forward. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Breakfast with Nina Warhurst and John Kay. Our headlines today. The final farewell. In the night, angels and archangels. Queen Elizabeth is laid to rest in Windsor alongside her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. As the period of national mourning comes officially to an end, flags across the country are now returning to full mast. The private committal service followed the Queen's state funeral as the nation said goodbye. As Westminster gets back to work, the Prime Minister Liz Truss will vow to spend billions more on military and for Ukraine. It's Tuesday the 20th of September. Our main story, the royal family will observe another week of mourning for Queen Elizabeth and are not expected to carry out any official engagements. That's at the request of King Charles. The late monarch was laid to rest with her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, during a private burial service yesterday evening, which was attended just by close family uh, following the state funeral on a scale that we'd not seen anything like it for six decades, no, have we? No, indeed. And well, today the official period of mourning comes to an end. And with that, flags across the UK, which have been at half-mast, return. As the top of Parliament, this... The roof of number 10 Downing Street, the Union flag back at full mast alongside the Ukraine flag. The Prime Minister heading to the United States today for talk there as, as politics gets back to normal, whatever normal is in politics. But uh, Dan Johnson has been reflecting on that extraordinary day of events yesterday. What are we to make of such shared sorrow? How does this emotional response inform our understanding of who we are? Beneath the turning leaves of Windsor's long walk, the late Majesty's coffin passed to the place she called home and where she was laid to rest. A reign at its end, the culmination of ten days of collective grief. So as the public gaze finally yields, how shall we reflect on this long procession of mourning. Earlier on, the music got me, some of the tunes, um, yeah, and now I just feel a blubbering red, but I suppose it's good to let it out. Emotional, difficult. I had, must say I had, I had a lump in my throat. I'm, I can quite happily say that I did feel very emotional about it, and it was hard. <laughs> This was the grandest occasion Britain could stage. From Westminster Hall, pulled by Royal Navy sailors, just the short distance across Parliament Square. And a reminder, here is a family's grief 
in full public glare. The crisp morning light of Westminster Abbey fell on a congregation of global leaders and generations of royals. The eyes of the world watched a solemn service of thanksgiving in high praise and rousing hymns. Then the slow march resumed down Whitehall with military precision and remembrance. She was our boss. I was really proud to serve for her, you know, and she was everything. Everything we did, it was HMS, Her Majesty's ship, everything. She was just brilliant, a true leader. I always looked up to her, um, but it's when I met her that I realised what, what kind of a lady she was. And t to me, it was, it was family, you know, um, knowing that she really did care for for her, you know, for her, her people and, and, and her country. They filled the length of the Mall and further, knowing the bedrock of so much for so long has gone. And now we, the new Elizabethans, will take our place in history's endless procession. By the time she reached Windsor, thousands were waiting to pay homage, as were these two, Mick and Sandy. Of course, this is first and foremost about sadness, respect and giving thanks for the Queen herself and her life of service. But then there's so much more going on here because it's raised so many deeper emotions in so many different people. And whether you support the monarchy or you don't, this is undoubtedly a significant moment in our civic life. I think it's an absolute moment in history. I think it's pivotal. Uh, um, I don't think we'll ever see the like of this again. Yeah. She was very, very special queen, human mother, grandmother. Um, and it felt appropriate to be here to pay respect. In St George's Chapel, the last rites of monarchy were performed in ancient ceremony. There are now new passages in the story of this kingdom. But in leaving Elizabeth II finally to her family, we're gently closing an entire volume of our rich and treasured history. Dan Johnson, BBC News, Windsor. What a day it was. What a couple of weeks it's been for all of us. And we can speak now to our correspondent, Charlotte Gallagher, who's at Windsor Castle this morning, where... Finally, Charlotte, the royal family themselves can come together and grieve in private, away from the cameras. They can, John, and I imagine they're breathing almost a sigh of relief this morning that they can have that time privately together. Since the Queen died, it's really been non-stop, especially for King Charles and the Queen Consort Camilla. They've been meeting well wishers. They've been travelling up and down the UK, meeting world leaders, meeting UK politicians, meetings to be held, things to be sorted out. It must have been absolutely exhausting. I know a lot of people have been saying they've been watching the television and feeling so sorry for the royal family that they're grieving a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother, and then having to do this work as well, and all public eyes are on them, even when they were standing around the Queen's coffin. It's been, I'm sure, a really, really hard time for them. But now, as you said, they can come together in private and grieve the Queen. The period of royal mourning won't end until next Monday. So what you'll see on royal buildings right across the UK is that flag at half-mast, except where King Charles is. So the royal standard will be raised to its full height. So here at Windsor Castle this morning, we can see he's here. The flag is raised up, the royal standard. But yes, definitely a time for family time, time together, time to reflect on Queen Elizabeth. Charlotte, thank you very much indeed. Uh, but you can see there in Westminster, in the Houses of Parliament, the flag now back at full mast. Normal politics resumes today.
Yeah, that's following that 10-day suspension following the Queen's death. The Prime Minister will meet world leaders in her first overseas trip in the role this week, promising to match spending on military support for Ukraine next year. And rail services from London's Paddington Station remain disrupted this morning because of uh, big problems with overhead power lines. Uh, passengers hoping to travel to London or from London uh, back from the Queen's funeral procession yesterday were also affected. And Network Rail has apologised. They're advising passengers not to travel on that line unless absolutely necessary. It really is back to business as usual. Yes, isn't yeah, it? it really is. Sound Transport familiar. disruptions and all. Uh, it's coming up to quarter past eight. Uh, time now to get the news, the travel, and the weather where you are this morning. Oh, Hello, good morning. This is BBC London. I'm Frankie McCamley. An intensive clean-up operation has begun after hundreds of thousands of people came to the capital to pay their respects to the Queen. In Westminster, street cleaning vehicles were decorated with black ribbons as they cleared the litter. Throughout the night, work was also underway to replace all the traffic lights that were taken down for the procession. The Queen's funeral was also a major event for the police, with more than 10,000 officers deployed from every force in the UK. Scotland Yard says as of five o'clock yesterday afternoon, 67 people had been arrested. Now, as for all of those floral tributes left for the Queen in Green and Hyde Park, they're going to stay put until next week to give people time, a ch time to get down and take a look. Over the last 10 days, visitors from around the world have descended on the capital, leaving beautiful displays of messages and support. Well, that's it from me. I'm back just after nine. Now, though, I'll pass you back to Nina and John. Bye bye. Hello there. Welcome back. Just after a half past eight on Tuesday morning, breakfast today with Nina and John. Now, while mourners gathered inside Westminster Abbey for the state funeral of Queen Elizabeth II, thousands lined the streets of central London and millions more watched Her Majesty's final journeys from their home. Yeah, it was a day when people around the UK stood still and fell silent, reflected as a nation as we bid final farewell to Britain's longest reigning monarch. And Jane McCubbin has this report. We watched in our homes, in our churches, in our cinemas, our clubs, our parks. She united us in one final act of togetherness. I live on my own and I didn't really want to be on my own today because it's such an emotional day and I'm never going to experience this again. In Alruos, the church bells rang to call their community together. Brothers in arms, Brian and Paul, had served together in the Gulf War. First thing this morning is I wanted to just uh, reflect on myself uh, and, and just, just watch it in peace. But actually, to come here with Brian, it's, it's been great to get that army brotherhood together. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad I came down, actually. I got very upset um, because, obviously, as we always say, it's our boss. And we'll never have a, another boss like her, I don't think. This emotion is not easy for everyone to understand, nor is it easy to explain. How would you explain the emotion that you've felt today? It's here, always here. And now, you know, I can honestly say that. I mean, I'm sorry, for everybody, it's all here. I don't know what it is, but it's, we're the best in the world at it, aren't we? So we've got to be like that. You know, that doesn't mean the <laughs> Pubs like the Red Beret in Withenshaw opened to offer companionship, community. A lot of my customers that haven't got company, so it's nice for them to come out and have a bit of company and watch something that they'll probably never ever see again. Remember, always somebody cares. That's why I made all that, that's not all that. Remember, always somebody cares. 
moment in which many people thought not just about the monarch, but of their own loved ones lost. There's only me and my son, and lost me, my daughter. She would have been here with us, but unfortunately she died. But it was, you know, we, we, we stick together, and it was good. We have to carry on like she did. She was a, she was a stalwart to us all. She was, bless her. God bless her. Wonderful woman. They watched in the Chukta's landing in Leith. I think it's a time to reflect. I think we've all lost someone, and so it's an opportunity and time to think about that, um, those people that have gone and the people you've still got left. And they watched in the Alma pub in Harwich. The youngest was one and the oldest was 91. A perfect British ceremony in the perfect British institution. It was a privilege to be able to share this moment with the community around me and my neighbours. Very many watched with neighbours, just as Doreen Dyer did in Milton Keynes. She's just stability, actually. Um, I can't imagine a life without her. The final journey to Windsor now. Some, like Colin Edwards, chose to watch alone. He'd met the Queen 150 times before finally saying his goodbye from his sofa in North Wales. I've watched the whole thing. Incredibly moving, spectacular. Britain is the envy of the world. No other country in the world could stage a show like this. The Queen would be overwhelmed by the response of people. The eyes of perhaps billions of people around the world saw this response and what they saw looked like unity. She means a lot to Northern Ireland. I suppose this country has its friction over the years but um, she's been kind of a force for reconciliation, hasn't she? She'll never be forgotten, will she? Ever, ever. I'm getting emotional, I'm sorry. And so 10 days of national mourning came to an end, with images which are likely to be the biggest live television event in history. Images which will never be forgotten. They won't. They really won't. Jane McCobbin reporting there. You know, we did yesterday's programme from uh, a gantry that had been built right outside the Abbey. And we just couldn't leave. The programme came to an end, but we just stayed there watching for, for several hours. It was just something that I think everybody, whether watching on TV or watching in person, just felt they had to be a part of, had to witness. It was witnessing history, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, totally. Wherever you watched it. Um, 200 people were named in Her Majesty's birthday honours list and joined presidents, prime ministers and the royal family inside Westminster Abbey yesterday. And among them were Pravnav Banot and Barbara Krellin, who we spoke to earlier in the week and we are delighted to catch up with them both again now. Good morning to both of you. Uh, thanks so much. Pranav, it must have been quite a day. Just talk us through what will stay with you. It really was, um, and I'm feeling absolutely exhausted. I'm still trying to digest exactly everything I saw yesterday. But I think what will really stay with me is not just the fact that there were all these world leaders just walking a few metres ahead of me without any security detail or press, but the fact that I, I had... I saw the coffin. I saw Queen Elizabeth's coffin walking right past me within touching distance. And it gave me a real opportunity to pay my respects, as well as being a very public, uh, a very public affair. I think what I read, what will really stick with me is how it felt very private at the same time. I think the Archbishop of Canterbury really honed down on the fact that this was a family grieving. So the, the, the balance between it being a state funeral but feeling very private within the Abbey is certainly something uh, that I will uh, remember. Barbara, we spoke to you beforehand when you had the invitation and part of you just sort of said, well, why me? Why, why should I be there? Did it feel real once you were there? 
It felt real and very, very special. And I just echo all the previous comments. It was just absolutely, I was in awe and wonder of the whole thing yesterday. And you've managed to make it on holes, I see, because you had to change your plans, didn't you? I did. I was due to come out last Thursday, but I came out last night. And take us there. Take, take us into the Abbey, Barbara. Just just describe the, the, the sense, the atmosphere during that experience. The atmosphere was very reflective, uh, an atmosphere of remembrance. Um, just it just made you almost gasp um, and the bit about being able to almost touch the Queen's coffin we were very fortunate because we were on the front row on along along the aisle and just you know as I say no security nothing you could just touch and the one thing yes I was moved right through the service and very very close to um, tears the one thing that came over to me especially at the end as the royal family were leaving um, that I was in touching distance of them and at anybody else's funeral people would have been consoling each other hugging each other and they just looked almost in isolation it was a family funeral but it was a national and international um, funeral and you just felt as if you just wanted to give them a hug. Um, several, I made eye contact with several of them and they made eye contact back. And I just wanted to sort of reach out to them and say, you know, I'm here and I'm sure the whole world were doing exactly the same thing, but it was just such an experience. It, it will stay with me for the rest of my life. That's such an important way of putting it. You've, you've summed it up perfectly there. I, I, I was feeling exactly the same watching them. It, it, it's at that moment you realise that their life is also their job, their role, isn't it? And that, that there's never in those moments a, a truly private moment because they know the eyes yeah. of the world are watching. And the children there as well, that struck me to little Prince George and Princess Charlotte. They are now entering that same life. What, what, what was it like for you to, to see them? You sort of looked at them and thought, well, if it was my grandchildren, I'd be hugging them. But they were little soldiers. They walked between their mum and dad into and out of the um, abbey. And bits I saw on television last night, they were just so immaculately behaved. It, it's a lifestyle to them, I appreciate, but they are still children. And Prana, for, for many of us watching, either there or at home, it was a moment to think about Queen Elizabeth II, this global figure that everybody knows. But somehow, because it felt personal and intimate, we all started thinking about our own losses as well. That's right. Um, I mean, the last funeral I went to before yesterday so was my own grandfather's. So just being there did bring back uh, a lot of memories uh, of being at my grandfather's funeral and, and really that sense of loss and the feelings I had a few months ago when my grandfather passed away, I'm sure um, are being shared by the royal family today. But, you know, we were, I felt very grateful to be there. And the Queen had this incredible ability to build a rapport with not just state leaders and prime ministers, but also very ordinary members of the public. And that was um, very much reflected uh, by the congregation that attended yesterday. And Pranav, you were among 200 people who, who received honours in, in the Queen's uh, birthday honours list. That's why you were there. What did you think of that decision to include people like yourself as well as those presidents and prime ministers? Why did that matter, do you think, to say goodbye? Well, I, I think it was very much reflective of the personality that the Queen had. The Queen was one of the most selfless people. She was incredibly charitable. Um, I think she was a patron of over 600 charities. So I, I felt that the personality of the Queen was really seen uh, by not just the guest list that were in attendance, uh, but also the way in which the whole ceremony uh, was executed. Of course, uh, very grateful to have been there, um, but you always have a sense that actually there are probably far more worthy people uh, that probably should have been or could have been invited, um, but that doesn't detract away from uh, the sort of day that we had yesterday, which we will never forget. I'm sure everybody who was invited from the honours list absolutely deserved to be there. I'm so pleased you both enjoyed it. Uh, Barbara Krallin, MBE, and Pranav Banot, some of those invited from the birthday honours list to attend the funeral yesterday. What a day for them know, to absolutely, remember. Absolutely. Uh, 8.44 on Next Tuesday morning. Yeah, you're watching BBC Breakfast. It's 8.59.
Let's have a last look at this morning's news stories, shall we? And uh, the royal family will be observing another week of mourning for Queen Elizabeth. They're not expected to carry out any official engagements at the request of King Charles. Yeah, the late monarch was laid to rest with her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, during a private burial service yesterday evening, which was attended by close family. Well, this morning, flags on government buildings are returning to full mast. Uh, but because the royal family is still in mourning for another seven days, flags at their residences will continue to be flown at half mast. Well, Parliament resumes today after a 10 day suspension following the Queen's death. <laughs> Six minutes past nine, let's get the news, the travel and weather where you're watching us this morning. We'll see you in a sec. Maybe she's talking about. Hello, good morning. This is BBC London. I'm Frankie McCamley. An intensive clean-up operation has begun after hundreds of thousands of people came to the capital to pay their respects to the Queen. In Westminster, street cleaning vehicles were decorated with black ribbons. Throughout the night, work was also underway to replace all the traffic lights that were taken down for the procession. And the Queen's funeral was also a major event for the police, with more than 10,000 officers deployed from every force in the UK. Scotland Yard says as of five o'clock yesterday afternoon, 67 people had been arrested. And as for all of those floral tributes left for the Queen in Green and Hyde Park, they're going to stay put until next week to give people time to go and take a look. Visitors from around the world descended on the capital, leaving beautiful displays and messages of support. Travel now and Paddington Station is expected to reopen at around half in, in around half an hour following major disruption. Passengers are being warned to expect delays though throughout the morning. And those problems at Paddington are having an effect on the tubes with a part suspension on the Elizabeth line and minor delays on the Metropolitan line. Quick look at the weather now, staying dry with lots of cloud around, highs of 19 degrees. Well, that's it from me. I'm back with your lunchtime news at half past one. Until then, have a lovely morning. Bye bye. Eight minutes past nine. Welcome back to Break. Story. That's all we have time for this morning. Thank you for watching. Let's join the team at Morning Live. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you both. See you tomorrow. Coming up on Morning Live.